Welcome back to another episode of the Hustle Nation podcast. Today, as always, we've got a real treat. Mr. Alan Stein Jr. is in the house. Excited to talk about his books. Uh, Alan is author, keynote speaker, and so much more. Alan, welcome to the show. Oh, it's so great to be with you both. I'm looking forward to a fun conversation. Same here. Likewise. So, Alan, you got quite the background, uh, specifically that aligns with ours, which is a lot of sports and, and coaching. Before we get into all the fun stuff, tell us a little bit about your journey and how you got to where you are now. I'd be happy to. So I, I guess for the context of this conversation, it's important for your viewers and listeners to know that, that basketball was really my first identifiable passion. That was my first <laughs> love. And I, I fell in love with the game at five years old and here I am knocking on the door of 50 years old and basketball is still a major driving force and pillar of my life. And I, I say that because I just have uh, immense gratitude for the fact that I've been able to not only make a living, but build an extraordinary life around something that I've been so passionate about. And uh, I was a very dedicated player um, all the way up through the college ranks. I was able to play basketball at Elon College, which is now Elon University yeah. down in North Carolina. Um, and while I was at Elon, yes. I started to develop an equal love for the training side of the game, the strength, conditioning, the fitness, the nutrition, the mindset. So when I graduated from Elon in the late 90s, I figured what could be a better career than combining my first love of basketball with this newfound love of basketball performance training. Uh, and I did that basketball performance training for almost 20 years, um, primarily at the high school level, but was able to matriculate up and, and work with some really elite NBA players as well. Uh, until I, the, the most current iteration of what I do was in 2017, I decided to leave the basketball training space completely and pursue a career as a motivational speaker and a corporate keynote speaker. Um, but most of the lessons and strategies and disciplines and approaches and perspectives that I share on stage and that I share on page really come from my, my time working, uh, with elite level basketball players and coaches as a performance coach. So, um, that's kind of a, an abbreviated, uh, I guess, bio, if you will. Happy to pull on any of those threads if there's any of that that interests you. Yeah, all, all sorts of stuff. So, you know, one of the things I'm curious about is you've, uh, you talk about your coaching and your training and, and uh, well, through motivation, education, trying to, you know, train people along the way. Uh, you know, I want to I start almost, uh, you talk about the high school level and, you know, a lot of times at that level, you know, if somebody is already at, you know, D1 level or college athletics level and, you know, beyond, they're, they've already shown commitment, right? They, they're bought in, they, they know how to kind of burn the boat, so to speak, and, and go all in on something. You know, curious as, as you, you, with your experience with like high school players, that's still a time where there are those that maybe just had, uh, you know, a little bit more skill and athletic ability early. And so they've been able to kind of get away with, maybe less of the grind and the, and the dedication and hard work and therefore education. Uh, but then, you know, those others that maybe have been building those good habits, you know, they start to merge a little bit, you know, just curious, you know, as you look at those people that uh, maybe just don't have that, uh, that, that fire, that drive to do the hard stuff, uh, you know, ways that you've maybe try to tap into that to get people to kind of see kind of the power within themselves. Oh, absolutely. And, I want to make sure that I give a little bit more context. So the two different high schools that I had a chance to uh, serve as the performance coach for, uh, I was at Montrose Christian for seven years, uh, and our most famous alum is Kevin Durant uh, of the Phoenix yeah. Suns. And then I spent some time at DeMatha Catholic High School for six years, um, who's produced dozens of players currently in the NBA. So at the high school level, yeah. uh, these weren't your typical high schools by any means. I mean, they, for sure. they were basketball powerhouses. And most of the players that played at both of those programs during my 13 years ended up playing major division one basketball. And, you know, again, dozens of them ended up in the NBA. Uh, but outside of that, yeah. I, I own and ran a training business where I was working with your average high school player. So I have certainly seen yeah. every level of talent and every level of motivation that, that you just brought up. Um, but actually what I'll share now is um, how I treat my own children. You know, I, I have 14 year old twin sons who will be ninth graders in high school next year. And I have an almost 12 year old daughter who will be in seventh grade. And all three of them play youth basketball and they're decent little players, but it, it's been really interesting over the last year in particular. Um, I've had to have some really uh, difficult conversations with them because 
all three of them have told me that they have the goal of playing college basketball. And th- to be clear, this is not my goal for them. This is their goal. Yeah. This is something they've told me. And it's, you know, as their father, it's something I really want to support and champion and, and help empower. Um, but I've had to have a real difficult conversation with them on two separate occasions in the past year because I've had to tell them with all the love that I have in my heart that your current level of commitment is not going to be good enough to play college basketball. That right now um, you guys are approaching the game from kind of a casual perspective, a casual approach. And um what you're doing will not be good enough to play college basketball. And I know that as a former college player and as someone who has trained hundreds of players that have played at that level. So what I was crystal clear with my children about was um, one of two things needs to change. Either you need to decide to recommit and go all in and, and work on your game every single day, study film, you know, eat right, get great sleep, do your strength and conditioning exercises, work on your skills, You know, you need to commit yourselves and go after this goal with everything that you've got, or you need to decide that playing college basketball is not your goal, that you just want to play the game for fun. You enjoy being with your friends. You enjoy the camaraderie. You do love the sport, but you don't want to make the all in commitment. You know, maybe you'll be able to play at the high school level and and just have a fun time. And I told them either one of those options is more than fine. You know, I'll love you nonetheless, no matter what you choose but I'm not going to allow you to straddle the middle. I'm not going to allow you to, to have the delusion that you want to play college basketball, but you simply don't have the commitment or work ethic or attitude that's going to be required. So, you know, I, I told them there's no pressure and there's no rush because they're young, but at some point, you know, that fork in the road, they're going to have to decide which lane they want to go down. And um, whichever one they choose, uh, like I said, I'll love them uh, unconditionally and I'll support them, but I just want to make sure that they understand that, that, that having a goal, reaching a goal like that, which, you know, less than 1% of everyone that ever dribbles a basketball will be able to play the game collegiately. Uh, they just need to be able to go all in. So, you know, um, having that talk has, has hopefully kind of reframed that process for them. And as with most kids their age, there are some times where they're much more highly motivated. And then there's other times where, you know, not so much. And, and my goal as their father uh, is never to push them too hard but it's simply to be able to share kind of the path that they may want to go down since it's one that I've already been myself. Alan, having been a coach and having, uh, well, being a father of a teenage athlete who is kind of in that similar boat, how do you get your son or daughter, or maybe even someone you're coaching to want it more? Because you hate for yourself as a parent or coach to want it more than they want it. And I've always struggled with that. I, I've I've been around a lot of high performing athletes, not quite the Kevin Durant's of the world. Um, and I see where someone has a a gift from God, this natural talent, and you hate to see them maybe not use it or take advantage of it to the ability that they're capable of, whether that be, you know, high performing high school athlete, collegiate athlete, professional, whatever. How do you get someone to see that greatness or see that capability? With most things, I believe that you need to model the behavior that you want to see in others. Um, so uh, for my own children, you know, I let them know that, that right now as a keynote speaker and an author, that is something I am unbelievably passionate about. And I work really hard on my craft and I work really hard on my business. I, I am um, fully committed and fully dedicated to being the best speaker that I'm capable of. And even though that is a different domain than than what they'll pursue, I'm simply trying to plant the seeds that if you want to be good at anything, uh, you need to put in some repetitions, you need to work during the unseen hours, you need to have uh, relentless commitment towards your craft. So I I simply try to model that for them. Uh, Outside of that, you know, it's only been my parenting philosophy and that's all that this is. Um, I'm rather hands off. I, I take more of a supportive role instead of kind of a pushing and challenging uh, role. You know, I want to encourage my children, but I want to make sure they know that the love needs to come from them. You know, I I don't require my kids to go out and make 500 jump shots a day. Obviously that would help them in their pursuit of their goal, but I don't require them to do that. They need to want to do that on their own. Now, if they say, well, you come out and rebound for me so I can make 500 shots, I'll be there in a split second because I want to be there to encourage and to support. But, But I've chosen to take... Um, kind of a, a more hands-off approach. But but to your point, I, I don't know if that's the best. I mean, this is something that I struggle with 
you know, as a father all of the time. You know, I, I waffle back and forth in my own mind occasionally. You know, am I am I doing my own children a disservice by not pushing them as hard as some of my previous clients that I've pushed and, and other people's children that I've worked with and pushed? I'm not sure, but I, I do know that what's most important to me with my own children um, is the role of being their father. You know, um, I'm, I'm not their coach. I'm not their friend. You know, I am their father. And, and with that comes you know, a, a grave responsibility. So I do believe that my experiences and my expertise um, can give them some tools that, that, that would help them in pursuit of that. But I've chosen not to really push that hard. But, but they know that they can use me as a resource, but that they're the ones that are in control of the power switch. And I've had an individual talk with each of my children and say, hey, if you want me to start pushing you harder, if you want me to challenge you and push you the way that I used to push, Kevin Durant, I'll be happy to do it, but you're the one that's in control. You're the one that has the keys to the car. I'm not going to make you do anything. If you choose not to make 500 shots a day, there is a consequence to that. And the consequence is you just won't be a very good shooter. And yes. if you're okay with that, I'm okay with that. So we've, we've had some really open and honest discussions, but, but to really answer your point succinctly, it is something that I struggle with. And, and I don't know that I'll ever know how I've done as a father until 15, 20, 30 years from now, and my children are adults and they're able to look back on this time. Um, so, so we'll see. Yeah. You know, and just listening to you, there are a few things that popped out to me. So one, you kind of referenced this kind of delusional aspect people have where they're, they're putting in a certain level of work. Uh, you know, it starts with, you got to have a, a very specific goal, right? And so like, when you talk about your, and you know, this isn't just about athletics, right? This can be doing anything in business or in life, right? Yeah. So, so you have a goal. Okay, so it's a relatively specific goal, right? If I want to play D1 sports or I want to achieve this growth in my business or whatever. But I think it's interesting. I'm curious on your thoughts on that kind of delusional aspect because, you know, I see this in so many different businesses and so many different individuals uh, from adults to kids where they say they have this goal and they're putting a certain level of work in. But from the outside party, you know, we can see that that work, the work they're putting in isn't even half of what is needed or required. Yeah. You know, and I've often wondered about how do we break through, you know, to your point, kind of that fork in the road of let's just, let's cut out the delusion here, right? Like and what you're doing doesn't mean you can't, you can't be successful. It doesn't mean you can't be a good human being. It doesn't mean you can't have a good life. It doesn't mean any of that sort of stuff, but you know, why are you continuing to have this thought of this goal when you're putting in these efforts? And the last thing I'll say to that is I, I'm curious about, you know, how do we break through to those people? Because I know even for myself, you know, in, in like in our business, right? If I'm trying to coach a, a salesperson or a, a leader or something like that, a lot of times it almost falls on deaf ears, right? Like, well, this is the level of effort that you need to do in order to achieve the goal that you've said you want to have. <laughs> Uh, and at some point it's, you know, it's your point, it's your goal, not mine. And, and how do we, how do we break through that? Well, it's, it's a difficult task. I mean, cause everything it's, it's a matter of, of reference point. I mean, I'm sure that my three children many times think they're working as hard as they, they can. Um, yeah. so you have to be able to, to shine a light on what actual hard work looks like. You know, uh, I know before we hit record, we're having a, a nice quick conversation about the definition of hustle and that often people yeah. tell their children in sports to hustle, but they don't actually define it. It's, it's very ambiguous. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you don't have clarity on what it is that you want from someone, then you're going to get ambiguous results. You're going to get ambiguous efforts. So it's really important yeah. um, to clearly define that. You know, uh, since we're kind of speaking a little bit in metaphors and talking a little bit about yeah. both youth sports and business, you know, there's also this adage that if you're the best player on your playground, you need to find a new playground. Like you need to, you, you never want to be the most accomplished person in the room. You should never want to be the most successful person in the room. You should constantly try and seek out uh, mentorship for lack of a better word, or an example or a role model or an avatar of someone that's doing what it is that you want to do. So one of the things that I try and do as their father, and, and because I have some very deep relationships in basketball, and I know lots of coaches and players, is I just try to put my kids in those situations. 
a perfect example, you know, at the time of this recording, uh, later this week, I'm taking my three children down to Charlotte uh, because I work the Jay Billis uh, basketball camp every single summer. Uh, Jay from yeah. Jay Billis from ESPN is a good friend and personal mentor. Um, and, and I've worked his camp for the last 10 or 11 years. And, and I always make sure to bring my kids down. Now, they can't participate in the camp because they're too young, but they can be around it. And I'll have yeah. conversations with the kids that are at the camp who are all aspiring to play college basketball. And I'll just ask them questions about you know, their daily lives. Like how, how many shots do you make a day? You know, how committed are you to your strength and conditioning and those kinds of things so that my kids can kind of be around, you know, the types of players that they say they want to be. Uh, and I try and do the same thing in my own craft. I mean, I'm constantly trying to put myself in rooms with elite level motivational and keynote speakers and people that have written amazing books and who do tremendous, you know, trainings and workshops because I want to get better at my craft. So, uh, for me, I think the best thing we can do uh, instead of telling people that they need to work harder in this example is put them around people who are working hard at the level that, that we want them to emulate or at least be exposed to, you know, and also we have to realize and and I was the, the same way when, you know, when I was the same age as my children are now, you know, now this was pre Internet. This is pre social media, you know, and, and I really only knew as far as I could see. You know, and, and mm -hmm. there were plenty of times where I'm thinking, hey, I'm the best player at my elementary school. That must mean I'm pretty good because I couldn't even yeah. conceptualize that there's probably 100,000 elementary schools in the United States and every one of yeah. them has a best player. You know, so when you, you, you step into a bigger pond, it, it can certainly be humbling. And and I noticed yeah. that even, you know, with my time working at Montrose and DeMatha, you know, when the kids got to those programs from their middle school. It's like the ante was raised up several levels. Like what was what working hard meant at DeMatha was many levels above what most kids understood working hard at their middle school. And then, of course, when yeah. those players graduated and went on to play at college, the volume gets turned up a little bit. Now they're playing major Division One basketball. And, and that level yeah. of working hard and commitment is a little bit higher. And now you're surrounded by really elite level players. And then if you're one of the very few fortunate ones who then can matriculate up to play the game professionally, now you're around the best of the best, you know, in yeah. the NBA with minimal exception, everybody is athletic. Everybody is fast. Everybody is strong. Everybody is skilled. Everybody has a high basketball IQ, you know, I mean, so as you kind of move up that funnel, the definition of what it means to work hard or the definition of hustle slowly keeps increasing. So for me, I think yeah. the best thing we can do uh, again is kind of model uh, the level of effort we expect and put whoever it is, whether it's our own children or a, a, a someone that we're training or working with in the business world, we need to be able to expose them to the level that, that they should try and emulate. So Alan, as it relates to coaching, um, not just playing, but as you're a coach, and what is the difference between coaching in, let's just call it small town America, to coaching at a very high level elite high school or even as you get to college and then professional level players? Is it more challenging? And, and what does that look like in terms of you already kind of unpacked the, the, the version of it as it relates to the player, but how does that change from a coaching standpoint? Well, honestly, the, the fundamentals of coaching don't change. And, and if you look at the tenets of, you know, even the most basic premise of, you know, uh, if we're going to talk specifically in the sports realm is, is to make sure your players know that you care about them as human beings first and as players second. Like that doesn't matter if you're, you're coaching a group of eight year olds or you're coaching, you know, in the NBA, you know, that to me, that is a basic fundamental tenet of, of coaching. Um, what really changes when you start to matriculate up levels or maybe have exposure at bigger programs, um, it, just certain responsibilities will shift. Certain responsibilities will be heightened. You know, if there's more exposure, then you're probably under more scrutiny. You know, there's more expectations off the court. You know, if you're coaching at Kentucky versus coaching at Elon, where it was that I went, you know, so I think a lot of the, the, off the court expectations and responsibilities will certainly shift, but, but really, you know, uh, on the, the, the hardwood, it really doesn't change. Now there are certainly pros and cons uh, of coaching at different levels. You know, you know, when you coach a more elite level player, you know, the pro is 
they can do almost everything you ask them to do because they're unbelievably coordinated and talented and athletic. So you teach them some footwork and within minutes they've picked it up. You know, that makes that part a little bit easier than maybe if you're coaching some players that don't quite have those genetic gifts. But then you also, on the other end, when you're coaching elite level players, now you also have to manage egos. You know, you've got a group of alpha males who all think they are the best player on the team and all think they deserve to start and all think they deserve to get X number of shots. And that's another coaching nuance that you have to learn how to manage that. Whereas maybe in another program, not so much. So um, I don't really look at it as, as coaching any differently at the different levels other than some of those nuances. Um, and, and certainly, you know, the, the way that you would communicate with uh, a 25 year old NBA player is going to be different than the way I would hope you'd communicate with a nine year old who's just learning the game. But you know, at the end of the day, you should still be teaching the fundamentals of basketball. You should still be teaching um, the, the team cohesion and collaboration and how to get guys to play together and, and accept their role. Uh, you're teaching the strategy of the game. Hopefully you're teaching, you know, off the court intangibles like leadership and so forth. So really, I, I think coaching is coaching. And the beautiful yeah. part is, um, I don't think it's much different when you're coaching basketball versus coaching in business or any other area those same fundamental principles apply. Just you're not teaching players how to, you know, shoot, pass, handle the ball, defense or, or, or rebound. You're teaching them, you know, the tenets of business. But really uh, from a premise standpoint, I don't think it changes a whole lot. So just just to continue down that path, when you, you, know, you talk a lot about, you know, organizational culture and uh, creating high performance uh, cultures and, and, and organizations, right? So we, and Chris and I talk about this a lot. We're, we're, we're pretty passionate about it as well. When you think about kind of that first cultural shift and, and how to create that, I mean, we, you know, we talk with lots of different businesses that are kind of stuck in that middle. You know, the, the Chris and I talk about it as kind of they're stuck in mediocrity. They're, they're good. Uh, they're good. They, you know, they're profitable. They're, you know, maybe growing a little bit every year, but they're just kind of stuck. As, as you, you know, talk to different organizations and engage with different organizations, what are some of the, you know, first one or two things that you really are looking for as ways to start to elevate their game? Well, from a definition standpoint, I simply define uh, an organization's culture uh, as how well their beliefs and their behaviors are aligned. Um, if, if, if everyone in the organization right. consistently behaves in a manner that is in perfect lockstep with what it is they say they believe, you know, when I say believe, I'm talking about your mission, your vision, your core values, you know, your operating procedures, your standards, you know, if everyone is living those things as consistently as possible, then you have a high performing culture. Uh, if those two things have kind of splintered off, you know, we, we talk about these things but that ain't what we're doing every single day, then you have a low performing culture. So the very first thing I try and do um, is make sure that everyone is crystal clear on what those beliefs are. Is everyone crystal yeah. clear on our mission, on our purpose, on our vision, on our core values, on our operating procedures, on our standards of excellence? You got to be very crystal clear in all of that. Um, crystal clear in your role. Like what, what did you accept and embrace uh, the role that you have on this team. And, you know, um, and, and once all of that is crystal clear, then it's a matter of holding everyone to the highest standard and to the highest level of accountability to live up to those beliefs. And once you can get everyone believing and behaving as consistently as you can, because again, I, I never want the expectation to be perfection. You know, basketball is not a perfect game. Business is not a perfect game. Life is not a perfect game. Um, but can more times than not, most of the people in your organization say and do things that are in perfect alignment with what it is you say you believe. And when that is the case, then the leadership team in particular needs to make sure they're acknowledging that and praising that because that which gets praised gets repeated. And when you catch somebody on the team doing something that's not in alignment with what you believe, you, you, someone says or does something that is not in lockstep or in harmony with your beliefs, then you need to care enough about them to hold them accountable. You need to care enough about them to coach them up and let them know that is not how we do things around here. Um, and, and you do that through love. You don't do that through fear. You don't do that through punishment. You do that by letting them know, hey, I care about you and I care about us. And I care about you and I care about us so much that I'm not going to let you get away with violating one of our core values. 
I'm not going to let you get away by giving less than your best effort or, or showing up with a bad attitude. So when you can get everyone in the organization to care that much uh, about each other, then you've got something really special. I love that tie of you know, beliefs and behaviors, because to your point, there are so many organizations that might spend a minute on you know, talking about their quote unquote core values or core purpose or their mission statement or whatever. Uh, but then it goes on the shelf, right? There's no reinforcement. There's no discussion around it. You know, these organizations are hiring people every day. And, you know, other than maybe it's, you know, on a wall somewhere or on a website somewhere, they're not, they're not really embracing it. And I, and I really like your tie to the behavior piece. I know that's something we talk about a lot is it's really easy to say, here are our values, quote unquote, but how do, how do those manifest themselves? What are the actual things you have to do each and every day? And because to your point, you know, we've seen this even for, for, for our organizations, when you define them, even us as leaders is helpful because it's almost like our own scorecard on ourselves because, you know, we can't, we can't violate them either. <laughs> and that doesn't oh, mean we no, don't from time to time, right? Well, uh, you do because we're human, but, but then we're, we, we have like almost our own scorecard to hold ourselves to. Yes. No, I love that you brought that up. And that's the thing too, is even as leaders, we, we should be open and we should be vulnerable. We should give ourselves the same grace and space to be less than perfect. And, and we should be able to openly acknowledge when we you know, have a turnover, <laughs> when, when we make a mistake. Yeah. Um, in fact, um, I've always believed that one of the most important parts when looking for a new hire is to make sure that they are a culture fit. And one of the ways you can do that, two of my favorite interview questions to ask uh, number one, um, so you're, you're holding an interview with someone you think might be a, a good fit for the team. The first question is, which of our core values do you feel most aligned with? Um, I love that question for a few reasons. One, it'll immediately show you if they've done any preparation and researching you guys. And, and, and you know, because um, I'm assuming that you've made your core values public. They're on your website, you know, whatever. Uh, but, but have they even gone to the, the length to say, hey, this is the reason I'm even applying to work here is because I feel so aligned with what this group believes. So asking them, which of your, which of our core values do you feel most aligned with is a great question. Um, and it'll tell you a lot, their answer. Um, and then the second is, uh, when's the last time you violated one of your own core values? And that can cause for an awkward silence to say the least. It's an hard, it's a hard one to answer. Yeah. Um, especially when you know that you've got the spotlight of being in a job interview. Um, but I love that question also, cause it'll show you somebody's uh, honesty. It'll show you their vulnerability. Um, and, and let's be honest. I mean, I, I try and live my life by a handful of very simple core values and I do the best I can to live in alignment with them as consistently as possible. And even though this is stuff that I preach and teach on stage and on page, I'm still fallible and flawed. I still step out of bounds. I still make mistakes. I still inadvertently, sometimes consciously or unconsciously, violate my own core values. And like I said, I, I don't worry about perfection being my, my, my North Star. And instead, for me, it's all about progress. And, and I can say with a huge smile that I live in alignment with my core values today better than I have at any previous time in my life, a year ago, 10 years ago. And I'm, I'm very proud of the direction that I'm going. Certainly not perfect and I'll make mistakes, but I'm, I'm proud of the direction I'm going. And, and to me, um, asking those two questions in an interview will give you some really good insight to whether or not the person would be a good fit or whether or not they have the integrity and character of someone that you want to let in. Ellen, for, for those listening, I'm sure there are a lot of people saying, Ellen, what are your core values? I'd love to hear them. But if you don't, if, if someone's listening and they don't have core values, how does one go about saying, you know, I just don't know where to start with that? Because I've had some, but it's only through lessons learned, through, through missteps, through mistakes, where I said, that needs to be one of my core values. And I didn't even really know it other than like, I'm not going to take calls after five o'clock anymore. I'm just not working on the weekends unless it's something I really want to do as a passion project. How do, how do you help someone with that? Well, with what you just shared right there, not taking calls after five or not working on weekends um, would not necessarily be the core value. The core value most likely would be, you know, I want to have more present time with my family or I want to yeah. devote, you know, uh, I, I want to avoid the risk of burnout. So I need to untether, you know, so uh, it's always important that we go a little bit deeper into what it is that that the core value represents. 
Um, instead of giving you my entire list, what I'll do is that my, my first core value is respect. Um, I believe in respect at all different levels. You know, I respect myself. I respect my body. I respect my mind. I try and only feed myself healthy stuff. Uh, I respect the environment. I respect other people. I respect other people's opinions and beliefs. Even if I don't share them, uh, even if I disagree, I respect the fact that they have the right to have their own opinions and their own beliefs. Um, I, I believe in treating everyone with respect. It doesn't matter if it's a child or an adult. It doesn't matter if it's the CEO of a Fortune 100 company or someone on the building maintenance staff that cleans up at night. I believe in treating everyone with respect. Uh, I also make sure that people treat me with respect. I, I won't tolerate someone being disrespectful to me. Now, I make sure that I, you know, have a very high level of empathy and compassion. And if, if someone says or does something that's disrespectful to me, I do the best I can to give them the benefit of the doubt and just acknowledge that maybe they're just having a bad moment because we've all had bad moments. And I've certainly said and done my share of things that weren't respectful. As, as I've said, there've been times I've violated my own core values, um, but respect in every single area of my life uh, is something that, that I hold very sacredly and something I certainly try to model for my children. You know, I could give them a lecture on being respectful, or I could make sure that every time they see me interact with another human being, I'm treating that person with respect. You know, if, if it's a, a waiter at a restaurant, you know, you want to treat that person with respect and with dignity. And my children seeing that time and time again is going to be a much more powerful influence than if I just constantly tell them uh, that they need to be respectful. So um, if someone's not really sure where to start, I think just think of, of the values that you that, that you find most important. You know, what are what are the things that you most believe in? What are the things that you stand for? You know, what are the non-negotiables that you try and use to make decisions in your life? And, and kind of whittle those down. You know, I've always said, if you, if you don't stand for anything, you stand for nothing. So I think having Absolutely. them are, is really important. But also, I think what I was originally getting at are non-negotiables. Yeah. And I, I've, I've stacked up quite a few of them over, you know, my young career. Where does that align with the core values? Or does it? No, it, I think it does. I think these things are all, you know, they're, they're not mutually exclusive by any means. I, I think... Ultimately, what you'll do is you'll create a list of non-negotiables that should be in alignment with your core values. So if one of your core values is family, well, then having a non-negotiable of not checking your phone after five or not working on week weekends actually supports that core value. The way that you are able to be present with your family at night for dinner and on weekends is by having that, that non-negotiable. So I, I think those things are absolutely intertwined. So, Alan, another thing that I know you've you've talked about is uh, you, know, you mentioned this team cohesion, organizational communication, right? And like building teams, and you know, obviously, with all the sports metaphors we've talked about, there's there's a lot of overlap there, you know. But at the same point, when I think of all the different organizations that you know, that we're part of, and that we've talked to and consulted with, and things like that, in many cases, the word communication just gets thrown around. You know, and, and it, it, I've even had a lot of discussions with different leaders where, you know, at some times where, uh, you know, if, you're, if your team is, is uh, claiming that you have ineffective communication, that's a problem. But at the same point, is there any organization in the world that doesn't have some miscommunication? And so, and I think that in some ways that becomes the scapegoat where you talk to a lot of these organizations where they're like, well, no one has communication right. And it's like, well... I mean, yeah, nobody has it maybe perfect, you know, to your point of the, the concept of perfection. But, uh, you know, I, I still think, you know, organizational team cohesion, organizational communication, there's just this huge gap and it, it almost feels very nebulous to so many people. They don't really know how to craft it. So I know you speak, you speak to this. I'm just curious, like, how do you get your arms around that so that people can actually start taking steps to making it better? Yeah. And not only would I say communication or lack thereof is kind of at the heart of the dysfunction of any organization. I mean, it's at the dysfunction of any relationship. I mean, even, even just two people, whether it's, it's two significant others or spouses or it's parent to child or it's teacher to student or it's coach to player, you know, when there's rifts in communication, um, 
that's going to help, in, you know, not help, but that's going to increase the dysfunction. Um, sure. And really communication yeah. is just the ability to transmit a message is to make sure that what it is that I'm trying to communicate is what it is that you are receiving. And if there's any gap between what it is I'm trying to share and what it is that you're, you're receiving, then we have a problem. Um, and really, you know, one of the first axioms I learned in coaching was it's not what you say, it's what they hear that matters. And we want to eliminate the gap between what we say and what they hear. You know, you could, you could be a coach talking to a player and letting them know that, you know, you're probably going to play limited minutes this year uh, and play more of a, a, a role, you know, uh, coming off of the bench type of role. And that's what you're saying. And what they're hearing is coach doesn't think I'm very good. Coach thinks I suck and I'm probably not going to play a whole lot. And that's not at all what you said. Yeah. That's not at all what you tried to communicate, but that was the message that they received um, because there's so much emotion that's involved in communication and, and different words have different emotional connotations. So we just need to make sure that, that as, as leaders and as communicators, we're trying to own all of that. We also have to realize that we're always communicating. Even when we're not speaking, we're communicating. <laughs> You know, we're communicating through our tone and our facial expressions and our body language and our posture when we're in person. You know, you're also communicating tones. And, and that's why these can be really hard to interpret, you know, through digital communication, through text message yeah. and emails, you know, that, that, the you know, whether you put something in all caps or you put three exclamation points by it or you put, you know, different acronyms or emojis, you know, that's going to that's going to change the message that you're actually communicating. There's also unconscious messages that, that underpin what it is that we say. You know, for example, if, if you're a leader and you delegate something to someone on your team and then you turn around and you micromanage them, you literally or figuratively stand over their shoulder breathing down their neck. Well, you've said that you need some help on this project, but the message you're actually communicating is I don't trust you, I don't believe in you, and I don't think you're good enough to do this on your own. That's why I have to stand over your shoulder. So you're telling them one thing, but you're actually unconsciously telling them something different. And, you know, if you're going to constantly put that out into the world that I don't trust you, I don't believe in you, and I don't think you're good enough to do this. Now you're going to have some major uh, issues in undermining and eroding uh, collaboration and cohesion and culture. So it's just important that, that we're very aware of the message we are intending to communicate. And then we have to work really hard to do everything in our power to make sure that's the message that actually lands. And as you said before, let's not worry about perfection, but let's see if we can make some progress. You know, to every leader out there listening or watching right now, can your organization have slightly better communication in 2024 than you did in 2023? Can you have slightly better communication in June than you had in May? Can you have slightly better communication this week than you had last week? It's all about systematic, incremental progress. And anytime we can make progress in some of these big areas, leadership, culture, and communication, that's how we slowly start working towards organizational excellence. Uh, Ellen, you said something about micromanaging, and I, I don't think you can be successful doing it at any level, especially in sports or coaching. But I, I find so often, at least just in my experience, that those that are micromanagers most of them don't have the self-awareness to know that they're even doing it. And it could be due to a lot of different reasons. So if one's out there, they're listening and they say, ah, you know, maybe, maybe that is me. How, how do you generate some, some self-awareness? And it's not just around micromanaging. It could be around a lot of things. Well, I, I love that you brought that up because I, I think – one of the primary goals of leaders should be to create other leaders. You know, it should be able to, to provide some autonomy and, and be able to empower others to do things on their own. And with that comes an understanding that that person is going to make some mistakes, but that can be one of the best teachers. That can be one of the best ways for them to learn. I mean, that's really my philosophy in parenting. I mean, I, I know when I was younger, I made more than my fair share of mistakes. And I have the humility to know that my kids are going to make plenty of mistakes. And, and me trying to insulate them in a bubble and, and tell them every single thing they need to do every single moment of the day um, is, is not how you build uh, future leaders. And it's certainly not how you build high performing, productive, you know, self-aware human beings. So uh, I try to the best I can um, to provide some blueprints and some, pro provide some guidance um, to share some thoughts, but then allow my children to be their own people, allow them to, to express their individuality, allow them to make some mistakes. And it's, it's really no different in the, in the business world. 
So I think if you if you're not sure whether or not you're a micromanager, you just need to take some time to self reflect. And, and and when you ask someone for help on something, how involved do you stay? You know, do you basically say, look, this is what we're trying to accomplish. This is what I need from you. I don't care how you get there. That's up to you, but that's what I'm looking to do. And if you need any resources from me or you have any questions, uh, please, I'm here to support you. But outside of that, I'm going to let you do your thing and, and, and we can debrief after. And, and whatever it is that you're working on, if it goes really, really well, that's fantastic. We'll learn from that. And if whatever you're working on doesn't go as well as we'd hoped, well, we'll learn a lesson from that as well. But just know that I'm here to support you. I'm here to provide resources. I'm here to encourage you. But you need to figure this out and, and kind of take that, that somewhat hands-off approach. And, and of course, this is a very broad general statement. I mean, right now, there is so much nuance um, and so many different ways that you can approach it. I, I'm certainly not saying that this works in every situation, at every organization, for every leader. But just as a general rule of thumb, I've never met a really high performing uh, leader that has to micromanage everything. And I think the other thing I've seen a lot from the micromanagement piece is uh, in some ways it's almost lazy management and, and that's not the way they think of it. They, they think of it as I'm working really, really hard to manage these people and squeeze every ounce out of the lemon. When in reality, it's, it's, I say it's lazy because they just haven't taken the time to typically clarify expectations. You know, to your point, even when you talk about like the culture and, and defining behaviors, you know, I think there's so many organizations that just haven't taken those steps. And so they haven't, they haven't taken those steps. Well, if you, that is a lift, right? I mean, that might take months or even years potentially to really craft what are those true behaviors that you want, to your point, you want to model, you want to define, you want to reward, you want to incentivize, you want to talk about. But I think a lot of times with that, the, the micromanagers, Chris, to your point that they don't even realize they're doing it. It's because they, in their own heads, I, I'll even use myself as an example. I've done it from time to time in my career where when I realize I don't have real clear expectations for that person, I tend to micromanage because I haven't been very good as a leader to tell them, this is what I need. <laughs> this is what I'm expecting. And I think that's, that's a lot of times the vicious cycle that people fall into. Oh, absolutely. And I'm glad you brought that up. And I appreciate you sharing that. I mean, I used to be a notorious micromanager much earlier uh, in my career. And, and, and thankfully, I've been able to kind of figure that out and slowly, you know, let loose of the reins. Um, and with that said, I, I sure hope you guys know that, that everything we've shared in this delightful conversation, everything I share on stage, everything I share on page, I'm not coming from a place of mastery. I mean, these are all things that I still am working on and, and am challenged by, but I am happy with the progress. Just like I said earlier, I micromanage way less today than I ever have at any point in my career. So while I'm certainly not perfect, it's going in the right direction. And, and yeah. I will say this to anyone listening who has the, the courage to admit they're a micromanager. I know that that is not your intention. I know that you're not trying to, to make someone feel bad or you're not trying to, to convey the message that I don't trust you or believe in you or think you're good enough, um, but, but just realize that is the message that is being received. So while intent is important, what the other person receives is what reality is. And that's what we, we just have to make sure we're, we're conscious of. I think the other part too is that there are a lot of folks out there that don't really understand the difference between managing managing people and leading people. And I think, you know, I, I don't come from a place of mastery either, but leadership is what you want to do, but you end up managing people, what really actually looks like micromanaging to the other person. And that, that to me is something that I think in perpetuity as leaders, we all need to work on. Uh, it's not just a today thing or a tomorrow thing. It's it's a process. Absolutely. And, and, you know, one of the things that helped me is I just believe in kind of the self-admission and acknowledgement of, of some of maybe these faults that we have. So there'd be nothing wrong. Let's just say hypothetically, you know, you're the leader of a company and, and you've got someone that reports to you and you're, you know, you're going to ask them for help on their project and just saying, you know, uh, Hey, Dustin, I just got to let you know, um, I'm going to do my best to give you some autonomy on this because I do believe in you and I do trust you and I know you're going to do well. Just got to let you know that occasionally 
I can overstep my bounds and I can crowd you a little bit and breathe down your neck. If you feel that I'm doing that, you have my full permission, you know, to tell me to give you a little bit more space because uh, I don't want to revert back to some of those behaviors because, man, I'm so thankful that you are on our team and I'm really excited for what you're going to do with this project. And I'm going to do my best not to micromanage. But if you feel like I'm encroaching on you a little bit, by all means, please hold me accountable. Just having that quick impromptu conversation can take a lot of the air out of the balloon and let them know like, hey, I acknowledge this is a fault that I have. I'm telling you unequivocally that I absolutely believe in you and trust you and know you're going to do great. You know, that that type of conversation with some vulnerability can actually be a much stronger glue and a connective tissue between you and that person and will probably prevent it from happening in the first place. Yeah, that, that's awesome. Um, Ellen, I want to ask you one more question. Uh, a big part sure. of what you do is success simplified. And for those just listening, not able to watch, there's a big neon sign above your head that says it. Talk a little bit about that. And I ask because Dustin and I, very, very much a big part of our business and a big part of what we do is we believe that things need to be easy. Um, and when things become easy, they're not only fun again, but it's almost to the point to where you'll have no excuses and happens to be a, a subtitle of my book. But anyways, I digress. I, I'd love to hear more about your take on that. Sure. Yeah, this is the perfect last question to end on. I love it. Um, so I'm a huge believer that complexity undermines execution, that the more complex we make things, the less likely those things are to get done, the less likely they are to get implemented. Um, and it just creates too much unnecessary uh, chaos, if you will. So I've always been a believer in let's simplify things. Let's focus on the basics. Let's focus on the fundamentals. And, and all of this uh, stemmed from a conversation uh, I had the first time I met Kobe Bryant back in 2007. And I got a chance to watch one of his really early morning workouts. And I was really surprised that he was just drilling down on very basic drills, very basic footwork and offensive moves, you know, things that I had done with middle school age players. And he was just working relentlessly on mastery of those basics. And, and when I had a conversation with him later that day at camp, uh, I basically asked him, I said, Kobe, I don't get it, man. You're, you're the best player in the world. Why were you doing such basic drills? And he, he flashed that million dollar smile and he gave me a friendly wink, but he said something that changed my life forever. He said, the reason I'm the best player in the world is because I never get bored with the basics. And this concept of I never get bored with the basics, work relentlessly towards mastery of the fundamentals during the unseen hours. Let's not make things more complex. Let's simplify success uh, has kind of been the foundation to everything that I preach and teach um, to this day. So yeah, I, I think in any area of life, if we can get rid of the unnecessarily complex ideas and focus on the basics, um, yeah, we're, we're going to have a higher level of execution. And let's be honest, in both sports and in business, the name of the game is execution. You know, it's not what you talk about. It's what you actually put into practice. And we can do that by, by getting clarity. You know, we've, we've talked already in this conversation. We need to be crystal clear on our core values. You know, those core values, you don't need to have a dozen core values. And they certainly don't need to be, you know, complex you know, a handful of three, four, five core values that, that cover most of the bases and you work relentlessly towards living a life that's in alignment with those. Yeah, that's, that's really the key to high performance. So every year that I get older, excuse me, I'm not looking to necessarily add more tools to my toolbox. I'm learning to untether from the things that no longer serve me. Uh, I'm looking to let go of the things that aren't allowing me to move in the direction that I'm trying to move and be the man that I'm trying to become. Okay, Ellen, I have to ask one more question. You've had the chance sure. to work with some tremendous athletes. Outside of the Kobe Bryant story, do you have another quick hitting story from one of those, those high level professional athletes you've worked with you can share with us? Yeah. So in that same 2007 Nike Skills Academy, the Kobe Bryant Skills Academy, uh, there was a college counselor there um, who did not have the uh, physical stature or resume of many of the other college counselors, but there was something about this kid that was just different and it was special. And all of us coaches recognized it immediately. Uh, one of the most important of those tells was at the end of the first workout, this kid tapped me on the shoulder and he said, coach, will you rebound for me? Cause I don't leave the gym until I swish five free throws in a row, swish five free throws in a row. I know you two know this, but for anyone watching or listening, that's never shot a basketball, just know that it's a really high standard. A swish is a perfect shot by definition. You know, it doesn't touch the rim. It doesn't touch the backboard. It gets its name from the sound it makes by going nothing but net. 
And this young man was not going to leave the gym until he swished five in a row, which means he could have swished four in a row, hit just a little bit of the rim on the fifth one. It would still go in. He'd still be mathematically perfect. He'd still be five for five, but that wasn't good enough for him. He'd start over. And if memory serves, it never took him longer than 15 minutes to swish five in a row. And that young man was Stephen Curry of the Golden State Warriors, who by most accounts is the greatest shooter to mm. ever play the game of basketball. And we can end with this. Uh, that wasn't by accident. That wasn't by luck. It wasn't because his dad played in the NBA. It's because Steph Curry is willing to hold himself to unparalleled standards. And, and, and that's really the thought that I guess we can kind of end this on is, you know, the, the standards you have today, are they in alignment with the person you're trying to be tomorrow? And uh, I think that puts a nice red bow tie on everything that we've been talking about for this really fun conversation. Alan, that was Awesome. Thank you so much for being here. Before I let you go, can you tell the listeners where they can find you? And more importantly, your book. We didn't get a chance to talk about that, but that just means we're going to have to have you back. I would love that. That'd be fun. This was great. You guys do an awesome job. Uh, the, the main hub and everything you need to find out about me is at allensteinjr.com. Uh, there's info on all of my different speaking programs and keynotes and workshops. Uh, you can also find information to both of my books, uh, Raise Your Game, High Performance uh, Secrets from the Best of the Best, and sustain your game, high performance keys to manage stress, avoid stagnation and beat burnout. Uh, you can pick those up at Amazon or Audible or wherever you like to get books and audio books. Uh, I'm also very easily found and very accessible and responsive on social media, just at Alan Stein Jr. Uh, on Instagram, on X and on LinkedIn. Uh, so if any part of this conversation struck a chord or someone wants to ask a question or share something, uh, just shoot me a DM on social. I'm really good about getting back to folks. And certainly anyone listening, if you're ever looking for a speaker or someone to come in and talk about these concepts with your team, uh, you can just fill out the contact form at allensteinjr.com. And the content is great. Uh, it, I love it when people can tie sports, specifically basketball, to leadership and business. It just makes things more fun. Alan, you're the best. Uh, that was an awesome conversation. I, I Thanks, love the guys. examples, the just good convo all in all. Thanks for being here, for all the downloads, for all the listeners out there. Thank you so much. We'll see you next time. Peace.